Hello there. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm glad that you're with us. We're going to be continuing our series called Christ and Covenant. We've been going through the book of Genesis. Last week we looked at the call, uh, or two weeks ago, we looked at the call of Abraham and how God made his covenant with him. Uh, today we're going to look at one of the more uh, honestly dramatic and um, emotional and even difficult passages, I think, in the entire Bible, and that is in Genesis chapter 22. Um, the so-called sacrifice of Isaac. What we've been at in this series is trying to see the Bible as one story. Yes, it has two testaments and 66 books, but ultimately it's one story. We're, we're honestly good at times about knowing a lot of the stories of, of the Bible, but how well do we know the storyline of the, of, the, uh, of the Bible? And that's what we're after. Uh, today, in this message, I would like us to focus on the idea or the theme that the Lord is our provider. The Lord is our provider. I want us to see that today. Um, thank you for tuning in again. Let's open up to Genesis chapter 22, uh, starting in verses 1 and 2. Let's read that. It says, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Uh, we've jumped from Genesis uh, 15 to Genesis chapter 22, and a lot happened in between there. Uh, some of the things that are important for us to know is that Abraham and, and Sarah, they waited a long time for this, this child to be born to them. Um, it, was, it was a miracle, no doubt, because they were so advanced in age, they were well past the, the age of being able to, to bear children. Uh, they doubted God. Uh, when Sarah was told what God was going to do, she laughed. Uh, Abraham doubted. Um, Abraham receives his name. We remember last week he was Abram. Uh, God gives him a new name. He calls him Abraham, which means uh, the father of a multitude. He's reaffirming the covenant that, that he is going to bless Abraham. He's going to make him into a great nation. And through his line, there would come one who would bless all the nations um, and create his church. One of the things that happens as Abraham and Sarah wrestle with uh, waiting is they begin to doubt God's promises that, that this chosen uh, son would come through Sarah. And uh, Abraham... Uh, uh, has a child with his servant woman named uh, Hagar, and he has a son named Ishmael. But God continues to, to reaffirm that it's not going to come through Hagar, and that the chosen one, uh, son would not be Ishmael. It would be Isaac, and he would come through Sarah. Just before this, Abraham and Sarah basically send Hagar and Ishmael on their way, and the Lord provides for them, though they go their separate ways, but Abraham has lost Ishmael. His, his son that he had with this, this servant woman. They, they have gone their separate ways. Uh, now he's faced with uh, the possibility that he would also lose Isaac. And that's going to call all sorts of things into question. Is, is God really going to fulfill his promises? Um, will he lose his, his son? The way that he puts it, uh, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And he command, he's telling Abraham to offer him up as a burnt offering. That's a difficult thing to deal with that the Lord is, is, is asking this of Abraham. But one of the things that's important for us to see is God's motivation for asking this. You see in verse 1 it says, After these things God tested Abraham. Now God's testing uh, is, is a difficult thing to understand, but one of the things we need to know is uh, God is not tempting Abraham. He is not trying to cause Abraham to fail. He's not trying to cause Abraham to sin. God tempts no one. James Chapter 1 makes that clear. It says, God tempts no one. He can't be tempted by evil. And when we're tempted, we're lured and enticed by our own desire. It's our own sinful nature that tempts us. God tempts no one. But he does test his children. And again, he's not trying to get us to fail or, or, or to sin, but God used tests. He used trials that he allows to happen to us and that he honestly even leads us into at times to make us more mature in our faith to purify our, our faith, and to, to help us understand who He really is, that He will provide for us in our weakness. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith 
produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. First Peter likewise says, You've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested, genuine, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What James and 1 Peter are telling us is that God does something in our testing, in our trials. He produces something in us. He purifies our faith like gold in a refiner's fire. He produces steadfastness in us so that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Can God's children be complete without being tested? Uh, James would indicate no. See, part of God's purposes for us is to make us more mature in our faith by uh, the testing, the times of testing and the times of trial. But think about what God is asking Abraham to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice. This is the child that Abraham and Sarah have waited for. He's, he's come, he's been born to them, he's grown up with them. It's not just the emotion of, of having to, to lose his son, but he, he's calling into to question the entire promises of God. He told him that, that through his offspring that it would be as numerous as the, the stars in the sky and the sand uh, of the sea on the seashore. Is, is that going to happen? It's causing him uh, to wonder, no doubt, whether God, how God is going to fulfill his promises if he's being told to offer up his only son. One of the things Abraham is going to learn is that the promise does not rest on Isaac. The promise rests on the faithfulness of God, and we need to learn that same lesson. There are things in our lives that we feel like we can't do without, but God wants to show us that he is enough and that his uh, promises are true because he is faithful. Look with me in verses 3 through 5. It says, So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told them. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham obeys. He gets up early in the morning and he goes to do what the Lord has told him to do. There is not a word of protest, word of defiance recorded here. And we can't, we can't imagine how difficult this would have been for Abraham to do. And he's got three days of traveling. This is on the third day he, he actually saw the place that the Lord was leading him into. Imagine going for three days with your servants and with your son with you when you know all along what you've got to do. And, and the servants, it mentions, it says uh, that Abraham had brought two of his young men. These two uh, young men were, were sort of servants, but ba- they play basically no part in the story. They don't cut the wood, Abraham does. They don't saddle the donkey, Abraham does. Really, their only purpose is in verse 5, when Abraham says something to them, and I think it's very important what Abraham says. Look at verse 5, when Abraham says, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. We only have two options uh, for this. Either Abraham is being deceptive and he doesn't want the boys or Isaac to know what he's up to, or this is a genuine statement of faith. And Hebrews 11, it speaks to this and it marks out the option of deception. This can only be a statement of faith. Hebrews 11, an amazing passage in verse 17 and 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Listen to this. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. What Hebrews 11 is telling us, it gives us insight into what Abraham thought, why he says, We're going to go and come again to you. Abraham believed that even if he had to sacrifice his son, that God was able to raise him from the dead. He was that convinced of the promises of God, that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. Abraham believed God. 
He had faith in God and His promises. Even when his experience, uh, common sense, these things tell him not to, he's about to slaughter his son, he still has faith in God. Do we have this kind of faith in God and His promises? Do, do we believe that over against what we experience, over against what we're told uh, by the world, over against uh, our tendency and our, and our sinful flesh to doubt God, do we believe in God's promises? Do we have that unshakable conviction that God is going to do what He says He will do? We need that kind of assurance and conviction. Look with me in verse 6. So, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on his son, on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Father and son, offerer and sacrifice, walking together to the altar. Notice in verse 6 when it says that Abraham the father, he laid uh, the wood on Isaac. He placed the wood on Isaac's shoulders. John, no doubt, has this in mind in, chapter, in uh, John 19, 17. He, he records as Jesus is going to be crucified. It says he went out bearing his own cross. Isaac uh, points us to Christ, the sacrifice, the one who was to be sacrificed, bearing uh, the wood for his own sacrifice, walking towards uh, the place. Uh, Jesus is the better Isaac. He is the one who bore his own cross and went to the place of sacrifice. We cannot help but recall the gospel where God, it was not Abraham and Isaac, but God himself being both the offerer and the sacrifice, the substitute. Jesus carried his cross to Calvary for us, and the Father poured his wrath on him. Notice the, the question and answer there in verse 7 and 8. Isaac says, where is the lamb? And Abraham answers, the Lord will provide for himself the lamb. One of the things that the testing of our faith uh, enables us uh, to do is to see God as our only provider. We rely on a lot of things to provide for us. But it, when it's all stripped away, if what is most precious to us is gone, is God still our provider? Abraham believed that he was. Will we? So we, we've seen that a, a faith is tested. Look with me now to see that a substitute is provided. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. It says, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The Lord intervenes at the exact moment of the sacrifice. As the knife is about to fall, the Lord intervenes and stops him. Notice this angel or messenger of the Lord, how he speaks. He said, now I know that you fear God. And he's speaking as God. Notice he says, seeing you have not withheld your, your only son from me. This is, uh, I believe, a, a, a manifestation of Jesus. It's called the angel of the Lord. This angel of the Lord or messenger of the Lord figure appears several times in the Old Testament. And he speaks as if he is God. This is, I believe, a manifestation uh, of, of Jesus, um, the, the Son of God, second person of the Trinity. But notice he says, now I know that you fear God. Well, did, did God not know? Did he need for Abraham to go this far for him to find out if Abraham really believed? No, the Lord, no, the Lord knew all along. But what he's doing is showing Abraham something. He's, he's, he's bringing out something in Abraham. He's, he's testing Abraham, and he's going to use this for good 
in his life. Notice he says, now I know that you fear God. It's not being afraid of God. Fearing God, as we see in Abraham, is obeying, trusting, and believing even when it doesn't make sense to us. But Abraham does this, and the Lord stops him. And look with me in verse 13 and 14. So this, this is stopped, and at that moment it says, Abraham lift up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. In that exact moment, as he stops Abraham, he provides a substitute for Isaac. Notice those words. That's so important at the end of verse 13. Instead of his son, the Lord is not just stopping a sacrifice. He's providing a substitute for the sacrifice. God is showing what kind of God he is. Not only is he not a God who delights in child sacrifice, he doesn't want that. He's not like the other pagan gods uh, who, who people sacrifice children to, as was common in Old Testament times. God condemns child sacrifice in several places, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and in Micah. He condemns it. It's not what he wants. What he's showing Abraham is that he is not a God who wants child sacrifice. He is a God who will provide the sacrifice, who will provide a substitute. One of my favorite worship songs is called The Lamb of God. And it, the, the chorus says, The Lamb of God in my place, your blood poured out, my sin erased. It was my death you died, now I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. This is what... Jesus has done for us. He's taken our place. He has taken our place on the cross. The wages of our sin, which we're all guilty of, is death. It, cert it earns us eternal separation from God and brings down the wrath of a holy God on us. But yet, in the fullness of time, at the right time, God provided a substitute, the God-man, His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. You see, the garments of skin that God covered Adam and Eve's nakedness and shame with in Genesis 3. The ram caught in the bush here in verse 13. All the Old Testament sacrifices, the sacrificial system, it all points us to the cross. They're incomplete pictures of what Jesus would come and do in our place. So Abraham names the place the Lord will provide. Notice he doesn't name it, Abraham obeyed. The emphasis is always on the Lord and His faithfulness. He names it, the Lord will provide. He believed that He would, and He did. Look with me in verse 15. It says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven, and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The Lord swears by himself. He says, by myself I have sworn. Surely I will bless you. Surely I will multiply your offspring. See, the promises of God here are as rock solid as He is. We have confidence in God's promises because of who He is. And He reaffirms the promises. The promises of blessing, of numerous offspring, like the stars in the sky or the sand of the seashore. A blessing to the nations and the promised offspring, the promised Son who would come in Jesus. But notice He, he gives a new promise, a new aspect of the promise that we had not heard before. He says, Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. What he's promising here in, in, in an offspring who would possess the gates of his enemies, he's talking about one who would take over, one who would come uh, in conquest, one who would come and be victorious over his enemies, the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. This is fulfilled, no doubt, in Jesus, who defeated Satan and every enemy of his on the cross and rose again to life victorious. 
It wouldn't be Isaac. It wouldn't be Abraham's grandson, Isaac's son, Jacob. It wouldn't be any Old Testament figures. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, you get figure after figure who looks like they might be the one. But they fail again and again. Is it David? No, he fails. Is it Solomon? No, he fails. All these Old Testament figures fail, but they point us to the one who would come from Abraham's line, who would come as a son of David, Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen and anointed one. He would be sacrificed, but he would raise victorious. So here we see that Abraham's faith is tested, that a substitute is provided for Isaac, and that the promises of God that he made, he reaffirmed them to Abraham. The main thing I want us to see, is, see today is that God is our provider. For Abraham, he, he certainly provided the testing of his faith, but he also provided the ram and the reaffirmation of promises. Sometimes it looks similar in our life. Sometimes God does provide trials that test our faith, yet he promised never to leave us or forsake us in them. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for he is with us. Not only does he sometimes provide trials, but he has provided the ultimate substitute, the ultimate sacrifice to atone and save us from our sins. You see, he, he's not asked us to save ourselves. He's not asked us to earn his righteousness, earn his grace, earn his favor, earn a place with him. He knows we can't. He provides himself to die in our place. Only Jesus saves. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Jesus Christ. And lastly, um, in Jesus and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, he continues to provide reassurance and reaffirmation of the promises. Ephesians 1 says that the Spirit is the down payment of the inheritance that we're going to acquire in heaven. It's how we know that His promises are sure. He has placed His Spirit in us. He is not done with us. He will never be done with us. He will fulfill what He has promised. So we look to God who dwells within us in the Spirit. We look to Jesus who died for us. We look to the Father who sent His Son, our God three in one. He is our provision. That brings me to the last point. That in all these things, in the trials, in uh, our daily lives, and on the cross, God, what He does is He doesn't He doesn't just provide us things. He doesn't just provide us some some people. He what He's doing in all these things is He is providing us Himself. That's what He does. He gives us more of Himself, and that is what we want. His presence in our lives is our good. So we need to stop looking for other people and other things to provide for us. And we need to look to God. And, and most of all, we need to look to the cross. Where at the fullness of time, once for all, He paid for our sins. He died for us. And He raised the life. He gave us His Spirit. continues to love us, provide for us, test us at times, and reaffirm the promises.